Hare Krishna. Welcome back to the issue of Nishit course. Today we will do the 10th, 11th verse now. So yesterday we completed 10th. Let us have a quick overview of 9, 10, 11 to see what is happening. So I have put a paraphrase, trans simplified translation of these verses over here. Avidya takes to darkness and Vidya to greater darkness. That is 9th. Then 10th is Vidya gives one result and Avidya gives another result. And now 11th will say Vidya and Avidya together grant immortality. Now wh what does this mean exactly? Here if you see, first if you just look at Avidya and Vidya straightforward way, then it will seem very confusing, even contradictory. So we discussed how Avidya and Vidya mean different things. Let's look at that once again and then we will understand what Vidya and Avidya mean in the 11th verse that we are going to study today. So, so in the ninth mantra, Avidya means ignorant pursuit of sense gratification. A person doesn't know about any higher values of life, that's why the person chases after sense gratification. There Vidya refers to, it's so called Vidya, it refers to having knowledge and using one that knowledge to pursue sense gratification. So that will take a per it will make a person do more damage because the intelligence will be used to create suffering uh, in a more sophisticated way for oneself through greater pursuit of sense gratification. Now in the 10th mantra, uh, avidya refers to both what was referred to in 9th. It refers to knowledge for pursuing sense, gra sense gratification. That means it includes both the ignorant pursuit and the knowledge of pursuit with knowledge. Both are included in sense gratification. And Vidya refers to knowledge for pursuit of Krishna consciousness. So one result is obtained by this and another by this. Now in 11th mantra, Avidya refers to not knowledge for the pursuit of sense gratification but knowledge for bodily maintenance. And here Vidya refers to knowledge for the pursuit of Krishna Consciousness. So let us look at the mantra. Vidyam cha vidyam cha yastad veda bhayam saha avidyayam rityum dirtva vidyayam ritam ashnate So Vidya and Avidya istad veda ubhayam saha So Veda means to know. Ubhaya means both. So when one knows both, both of these Vidya and Avidya, that means knowledge for material maintenance and knowledge for spiritual advancement. Then what will happen by that? Avidyaya, Mrityum, Tirtva, the cycle of birth and death, this death that is there, the journey in this life that is there, for that we need material knowledge. So when we have material knowledge, we will navigate the journey of life. And then Vidyaya, Mrita, Mashnute, by Vidya one will attain eternal existence. If I am in an ocean, I need to know two things. I need to know how to ride the boat in the ocean uh, and then I need to know where the land is and get to the land. If I just know how to get to the land but I don't know uh, how to take the boat towards the land, I need to have some basic knowledge about the boat. So without that, even if I know where the land is, I will not be able to get there. So if one has only spiritual knowledge and one doesn't have basic knowledge for bodily maintenance at least, then one will not be able to live in this world and one has to live so that one can ultimately attain the destination so both material and spiritual knowledge are important but material knowledge is not the knowledge of how to become happy in this world but it is to how to live fruitfully in this world how to live so as to fulfill the purpose of the world so both when we have so knowledge of the riding the boat takes us through the ocean and knowledge of where the land is takes us to the land similarly Material knowledge helps us to navigate with the problems of life. But what what is the ultimate purpose of navigating the problems of life? What is it that ultimately I am meant to achieve? We cannot solve the problems of life at a material level. But if we live intelligently, then we can raise our consciousness and go beyond these problems, ultimately back to the spiritual world. So let us look at Srila Prabhupada's translation. Only one who can learn the process of nations and that of transcendental knowledge side by side can transcend the influences of repeated birth and death and enjoy the full blessings of immortality. So full blessings of immortality. Amrita Mashnute. So both have to be cultivated side by side. 
that's what Srila Prabhupada says and the translation based on the mantra so now let us look at the overview of the purport so this is a long purport among the longest in this book is Upanishad with 14 paragraphs in it and Srila Prabhupada in the first five paragraphs tells about how immortality is impossible materially then he describes immortality is possible only by following Krishna's teachings and then he describes how what these teachings are and how these teachings can be applied briefly then he says actually Krishna himself descends from the spiritual world to the material world to make us immortal so now actually how this is the title immortally possible only by following Krishna's teachings that is like a mega title or a big title and the remaining are subtitles so 67 is Krishna comes to make us immortal and then how do we become immortal Krishna is teaching us the process first thing is sense gratification binds us to mortality so restrict it then Aparadharma teaches us how to balance our material side and our spiritual side that is in two paragraphs and then the last three paragraphs talk about how Paradharma grants immortality so in this way Shri Prabhupada is giving us a systematic overview of the process how by, by which we will attain with Amrita Mashnute, we will attain immortality. Now, why is it impossible to attain immortality materially? Shri Prabhupada gives a scriptural example and then he gives a logical analysis also briefly. The scriptural example he gives is that of Hiranyakashipu. Hiranyakashipu used his full intelligence, did enormous austerity, got the kind of power which none of us can even uh, ever get. But in spite of all that, in one moment everything was destroyed. Kalat Manopanayamam Nijabhritya Parshvam. Prahlad Maharaj says, My dear Lord, I saw that in one moment, Kalat Manopanayamam, that by the power of time, Kalat, by you manifesting as time, what happened is everything was destroyed. And therefore, I do not consider any of these things valuable. They are all temporary. No matter, even if one gets opulence to the extent, not use of Indra, but to the extent of Brahma, still that will be of no use. Actually, it is only the association of devotees and through the association of devotees that one gets devotional service, Nijibhritya Parshvam. That is a factual value. So, Hiranyakashipu demonstrates to us through his negative example of what will not grant immortality. There is a similar anecdote of Ravana. Ravana, when he was going around on this universe desecrating campaign, he was going around conquering the universe and wherever he would find some beautiful woman, he would desecrate them or abduct them. He would defile them. So, when he was doing all this, he saw Narada moving around. Now, he knew Narada was associated with the sages, was with the, with the Lord with, and with the gods. So, he thought Narada is my enemy. And he decided to kill Narada. Now, when he started shooting Narada, at that time what happened? All the arrows that he shot, the arrows which even the gods could not withstand, the arrows which caused gods to fall or flee, those arrows just went into Narada's body and they just disappeared in his body. And Ravana used all his formidable weapons and nothing happened. Finally, Ravana sobered down. He says, what is this person? How has he got so much power? He says, oh, Narada, please come in. He just calmed down. You know, the idea, of st the strategy of demons is, if you can't conquer somebody, befriend that person. So they can just change their face, their attitude, depending on what will favor the sense gratification. He said, oh, this person is so powerful. Maybe I can find out what is the secret of his power is. Call Narada, please come in, please come in, have a seat. Narada sat down. He said, you know, you are a great sage. Please tell me. How is it that none of my weapons are affecting you? He says, be simple, because I have a spiritual body. He says, spiritual body, what is that? He says, spiritual body means that is eternal, that is indestructible. He says, I want that. How can I get it? He says, simple. He says, I am chanting the names of the Lord. You start chanting the names of the Lord, become his devotee, and he will give you a spiritual body in the future. He says, yeah, nothing doing, get lost. So he says, no, I don't want to do that. So the demoniac mentality is, there is an authorized way to get immortality. That is, 
become devoted to God, rise to the spiritual level of consciousness, and they want to attain immortality. But the demoniac mentality is they want immortality, but without the consciousness that will take one to immortality. They want immortality at the material level. Now, Hiranyakashipu, Ravana, they may all fail. Now today, there are atheistic people, materialistic people, who try to also get immortality. Now, essentially, Srila Prabhupada explains that mystic power and scientific power are similar because both are ultimately attempts to manipulate material nature. Mystic power taps into the higher sources of energy that are there among the higher beings in the universe. So, Ravana does austerities, Hiranyakashipu does austerities and gets powers from the higher beings. Scientific power comes from not acknowledging any higher beings, even on the Supreme Lord, nor as representatives, but recognizing the power of nature, trying to figure out how that power of nature is working, and then trying to catch that power for oneself. But essentially, the idea motivating mystic power and scientific power in many ways is similar. That both are attempts to control material nature. Shri Prabhupada tells in his Nectar of Dist Devotion introduction that uh, yogic siddhis are similar to much of modern scientific technology. The yogis fly and with science will fly using airplanes. Essentially the activity is similar. The activity is to do in material nature, with material nature, what we are not normally able to do. So today people do not believe in mystic powers mostly and they almost entirely don't have access to mystic powers. So today people are diverting all their efforts to control material nature towards scientific and technological power. So is it possible that by future scientific advancement one will be able to attain immortality at a material level? Now, there is a huge hype about this, but Srila Prabhupada gives a simple reasoning why it is not possible. Why material immortality is impossible? Because matter undergoes six changes. And these six changes in matter are unstoppable, even incomprehensible. Un unstoppable means we can't check them. Incomprehensibly, we can't even understand them. And how do we understand that we can't understand? That is ensouled matter. This is the word that I have used because scientists often use the word living matter. But actually our philosophy tells us that, that matter is never living. You could say matter that has apparent life. So ensouled matter, that means matter where soul is present, consciousness is present, it undergoes three extra changes which ordinary matter doesn't. It grows, it reproduces, it preserves itself. Whereas ordinary matter doesn't do that. Ordinary matter, it is it is created. Since after its creation, it just exists. The next phase is, is deteriorates. And finally, it is destroyed. And if we create a house, the first phase is it's created. If we leave it as it is, by the passage of time, by the effect of the elements of nature, it will deteriorate. And ultimately, it will be destroyed. So ordinary matter, it basically undergoes these three phases of its existence. Creation, deterioration, destruction. Now, as in contrast with this, if we see matter, which scientists call as living, living matter, actually from our philosophical perspective, it is oxymoron. Oxymoron means two words which are brought together, which are contradictory in meaning. So, for example, if somebody says, that person is a chaste prostitute. If somebody is a prostitute, how can somebody be chaste? Or that person is a courageous coward. How can somebody be courageous and coward? Similarly, these are oxymorons. So, living matter, from our perspective, is an oxymoron. Because matter itself is defined as having no consciousness. So, we don't, uh, but matter in which life is manifest, so like our bodies right now, the bodies of various living beings, so they have some further phases to their existence. It's not just creation, deterioration, destruction. In addition to these, there is growth. If 
I keep a laptop here for 20 years the laptop if it has a, a particular size screen it won't go into a bigger screen it just stay as it is if I have a house of a particular um, area it won't grow into a bigger area so non non living matter actually all matter is non living but inanimate matter non ordinary matter it does not undergo any growth whereas wherever there is life there is growth small baby grows a plant grows even microbes grow now not only is there growth there is also reproduction there is no such reproduction in ordinary matter you know sometimes we may call uh, if we have some tools a carpenter may say that if one part fits into another part he may say this is the male part this is the female part but it is not that the male and female come together and produce other other tools that doesn't happen so actually speaking all that is there is just the nomenclature is there but essentially when there is living the living things and they, they are they reproduce the male female in whatever species they are they reproduce in some exceptional cases when some soul has done such sinful activity the soul is not even given the fac faculty for sexual enjoyment facility for sexual enjoyment then in those cases there may be a sexual reproduction among some very or some organisms with reduced consciousness but either way there is reproduction now matter does not reproduce whereas actually where there is life uh, where there is soul present there is reproduction and then beyond that there is preservation preservation means you know, if I take this watch and I cut it cut off the handle of the watch now the belt if it is cut off it will just stay cut off now, there is no blood clotting process that will happen by which it will start healing itself on the other hand if I take a knife tuck, and cut my hand over here there will be bleeding but afterwards there will be clotting and heal itself so whenever there is life and then life is present in the body that body tries to heal itself that preserves itself so growth reproduction preservation these are things which differentiate between ordinary matter and ensouled matter they are in one sense the physical symptoms of the presence of the soul now scientists may have some mechanisms about how clotting happens how growth happens how reproduction happens but mechanisms are essentially hows they are not wise there's a fundamental difference between hows and wise hows is the mechanism of how something happens so why is the purpose why does this happen so why does this kind of matter that makes a laptop not reproduce or I mean preserve itself or grow and why is the matter that is present in a living person grow reproduce and preserve so the point is these changes are largely incomprehensible so we don't even understand them what to speak of stopping them if you can't understand them also there's very little chance of stopping them and this is happens by the work of material nature so now there are many researchers or especially businessmen who make uh, business out of research claims who say that in the future you will never grow old or rather we have got a medicine by which you will again become young so actually speaking is it possible that somebody can become young no why is it not possible because essentially this body is something which we can't control now, researchers have found out that you know, the cells in the body are in a constant state of flux so new are created and old are destroyed but somehow as an organism keeps growing then they find that the, num the number of cells that are reproduced are less than the number of cells that are destroyed and that's how aging takes place or they're trying to find out are there some genes that control this they found maybe there is one gene so if you can just find that gene and then uh, take out that gene or deactivate that gene then the decrease in the uh, cell reproduction will not happen and then the person can stay on forever so people try this but this doesn't uh, work because they couldn't isolate any gene like that and eventually they said 
uh, now the current opinion is there is a whole network of genetic mechanisms which causes the decrease in the growth of the cells, reproduction of the cells. I say now if you try to deactivate this whole mechanism, so all kinds of disruption in the bodily uh, structure will happen. So we can't do that. So there's the International Gerontological Association which made an announcement that you know with, there's no technology, no medicine, no surgery, no therapy of any kind at all that can either reverse, stop or slow the aging process. We can't reverse it, that means you can't make an old person young. We can't slow it. Whatever age a person is going to grow old, that person will grow old at that age. And we can't uh, stop it also. Everybody has to grow. So what can we do? We can't do anything at all. We can just do something cosmetic. The hair has become black. We can try to make it, has become white, we can make it black. Some wrinkles on the face, we can try to remove the wrinkles. Some tooth have fallen down, we can put in the teeth. But this is all cosmetic. It doesn't improve the inner health of the body. Actually, Prabhupada said in a lecture, you know, the material nature will quietly, helplessly make all of us old. And actually, Prabhupada on a morning walk, and once one young man said, Ami, why do we have to, why do we have to bow down to God? He says, why does, he says, Prabhupada said, forget God. You know, you have to bow down to material nature. He says, no, I don't have to bow down to anyone. He says, will you not have to grow old? He says, oh, that is simply biology. Nobody can force me. He was saying that nobody can force me to bow down. Nobody can force me to submit to anything. He says, won't you have to grow old? He says, yes. Then you are forced to grow old. He says, no, no, no. That is simply biological nature. That, Prabhupada said, that means biological force. Do you want to grow old? No. But still you have to grow. That means it is biological force. So biological force means that the biology of the body is such that it forces us to grow old. Basically, we have to submit. We may not believe in God, but we have to submit to some higher principle which makes us do things against our will. So, material nature is too powerful for us to control and it is not going to allow itself to be manipulated so that human beings can counter the basic principle of material existence, that is mortality. So we can't avoid that. Death is inevitable. No matter how much we may try, we might get lots of technological advancements, but we shouldn't let those technological advancements deceive us. There are technological advancements of different natures. So making, uh, we had a computer of this size and now we have a computer of this size. This is basically manipulating nature within a particular zone. We are not changing the nature of nature. We are simply changing the way we process nature. The nature of nature is mortality. Nature of nature is destructibility. And no matter what we do, we can make some changes within, within the way nature works, but we cannot change the nature of nature. The nature of nature is that it is mortal. And that's why so many people try different things and people will keep trying different things, but nothing will work. So now, if mortality is not possible at a material level, then the question arises, where does our urge for mortality come from? If we were just biological creatures who are doomed to death, then why would we ever want to live? Why would we ever desire something that is utterly impossible? Whatever we desire at a, at a universal fundamental level, that is provided for in nature. We, we have thirst, there is water. We have hunger, there is food. You know, we, feel, we feel cold, there are things which make us warm. So whatever are the basic needs, they are provided for. Whatever the innermost cravings, longings that are there, they are provided for. So, if this longing for eternity, longing for everlasting existence is so deep-rooted within us, where does it come from? And it is not just present in human beings, it is present in all living beings. Now, sometimes if a fly is troubling us and we try to hit the fly, all that happens is we hit ourselves in different parts of the body. And the fly just expertly runs away. How does it do that? 
because it loves life and because it loves life it uses all its speed and alertness to evade any attempts any threats to its life so actually all living beings love life and they try their best to preserve life so where does this come from urge come from so actually the vedic scriptures explain that this urge comes from a part of us that is actually immortal and that part is the atma so we can infer the existence logically of something immortal within us through the presence of a longing for immortality within us so what that something immortal is we cannot know through logical inference we can just know its presence but we cannot know its nature for that we have to look at scripture and scripture tells us there is the atma and this atma belongs to the spiritual world so the soul is in the material world where everything is temporary because the soul is eternal the soul desires eternity over here but eternity is not possible over here when the soul moves from here returns back to the spiritual world eternity will be possible over there so shri prabhupada writes in the purport that actually we cannot make any attempts to we will not be able to succeed prabhupada gives the example of hiranyakashipu and he says the whole point here is that even hiranyakashipu the most powerful of materialists could not become deathless by his various plans what then can be accomplished by the tiny hiranyakashipus of today whose plans are thwarted from moment to moment tiny hiranyakashipus of today nobody today can have the kind of control that hiranyakashipu had no who can cause rains to come just by glancing but even he could not at the mortal what can be therefore shri ishopanishad instructs us not to make one sided attempts to win the struggle for existence what is the struggle for existence all of us are trying to survive Uh, darwin got some things right his idea was survival of the fittest but shri prabhu and it is true that there is a big big struggle for existence and everybody has to struggle in that for survival itself and he had the idea of survival of the fittest but shri prabhu pad actually give a penetrating one sentence report he said even the fittest don't survive so the relatively speaking the fitter may survive more than non fit but ultimately even the fittest don't survive so there's no use making a one sided attempt to win the struggle for existence if there's one soldier on one side and there are million soldiers on the other side and the soldier doesn't have any extraordinary weapons doesn't have any extraordinary powers then what is the chance that the person will win there's no point in fighting better find some other way to deal with that situation now if there is no other way to deal with that situation then maybe you can just keep fighting and die but there's some other way to deal with the situation why go in for a lost cause so the scriptures tell us that uh, the odds of one soldier winning against a million soldier actually that is far far uh, less it is extremely small but the odds of a person becoming immortal at a material level is lesser than that in fact it is zero it's impossible so why fight for a lost cause don't make a one sided attempt bro by staying over here then rather find out some other way to deal with the situation so immortality is possible but it is possible by raising the consciousness to the spiritual level that's what is and through aparadharma so shri shri prabhu pad writes further that shri krishna resides from the spiritual world and comes just to tell us how to go back to god so prabhu pad writes here interestingly that krishna sends not just scriptures in the vedic tradition but other scriptures also he sends all these are sent the lord has kindly dis- dis- delivered the above mentioned scriptures uh, in india and other scriptures in other countries so above mentioned scriptures for vedic scriptures and other scriptures in other countries should remind the forgetful human being that his home is not here in this material world so shri prabhu pad had this vision understanding that ultimately the various great religions of the world are arrangements by the lord to gradually elevate the soul to back to the supreme destination so there may be specific differences within various religions but the essential purpose and essential message is the same that is take the soul away from matter back to god now prabhupada further says that 
why should the soul want to go back to God? Prabhupada says the miseries of this material world serve to indirectly remind us of our incompatibility with dead matter. Very profound statement. The miseries of this material world, the miseries are there. What are the miseries? There's old, as I said, death is there. Let's consider death itself. Now, what does death remind us? There's so much suffering. They serve to indirectly remind us of our incompatibility with dead matter. So, what does this mean? That I don't want to die, yet I'm in a situation where death is forced upon me. There must be something incompatible over here. There must be something incompatible. What is that incompatible thing? That incompatible thing is that the eternal soul is striving for enjoyment and existence in a temporary arena. So whenever there is incompatibility, what is done? But sometimes there are marriages in which the two partners feel we are incompatible. And then sometimes uh, when there is separation, they say that there is irresolvable incompatibility. So, like that, the Vedic culture doesn't encourage divorce within marriage, but it encourages a divorce of another kind. What is the divorce? The divorce of spirit from matter. Recognize that spirit and matter are intrinsically and irresolvably incompatible. Spirit cannot enjoy through matter. So therefore, they have to be divorced from each other. Now that divorce is not a rupture, you can do in one moment. There is a process for disentangling the soul from matter. But first, we have to understand that there is incompatibility. And actually speaking, Prabhupada, right, they indirectly remind us of the incompatibility. Why indirectly? Because we may not learn that lesson. A lesson can be taught in one way. Directly is the scriptures teach us. Scriptures tell us this is not your, you are not the body and this world is not your home. So, many people have fascination with aliens. You know, somebody sees some flying saucers and some green little men and people make movies out of them, like E.T. and others, and then people are fascinated. Are there aliens? What does the Vedic world view see? Actually, there is life on various planets and different people from different planets can come on the earth. So there's nothing to get excited about the aliens. One of Shila Prabhupada's disciples, Sadaput Prabhu, has correlated between the alien sightings and the description in the Bhagavatam of Shalva's airplane. So there are similarities. But the important point is, rather than getting excited about aliens, the scriptures tell us don't, uh, tell us that we ourselves are the aliens. We ourselves are the aliens means we don't belong to this world. Rather than thinking that okay, some other people are coming on this world where we and they are not they are not don't belong here, so they are the aliens. So we ourselves are the aliens in this world and we have to go out of this world. We have to go back to the spiritual world. So this direct message is given by scripture and indirectly that means through the consequences of not living in according to this message indirectly we are taught through the life in this world so for example a, doc a doctor or a parent may say don't overeat otherwise you will suffer so this is the direct message now indirectly we learn the same thing if we overeat and then we get such a severe stomach upset and we suffer then we, oh i shouldn't overeat so that the direct teaching is what comes straight forward, so what comes through hearing. Indirect teaching is through experience. So now the experience has to be connected with the education. Then learning happens. Otherwise the experience will go in vain. So come again. I'll repeat this. Experience has to be connected with the education for learning to happen. So education means what is taught. Experience means what is experienced. When the two are connected, then learning actually happens. So if I get the experience of someone getting upset, but I don't think, oh, why does someone get upset? Just by chance it happened. What can I do? I'm just unfortunate. I'm unlucky. That person ate. Nothing happened to him. I ate. I suffered. Unlucky. But tomorrow I'll be more lucky. And tomorrow I overeat again. Then what will happen? Again I'll suffer. So experience has to be connected with education. Education was what my doctor told me, my elders told me, don't over it. So when the experience is connected with education, then learning happens. But if the experience and education are divorced, there is no connection between them, then I get the experience, I keep getting the experience, but I don't learn anything. So that is what happens to most people in material existence. 
they either don't get the education or they don't take the education seriously and then they get the experience of miseries in material existence but they don't learn they think okay you know i made this plan this plan suffered that person made a plan that person suffered Millions of people since the beginning of creation have all died with no exception at all. Yet we think we will be the exception. What can be more wonderful than that? Actually we have to take exception, exception to the hope for an exception. There is going to be no exception in material nature. Every single person has to die. And the mind's hope for exception is itself something which we have to take exception to. Nothing doing, I'm not going to listen to you. So when we connect the experience with the education, then we will get learning. We will learn. And then we will be impelled to make spiritual advancement. So the union of experience and education is what each of us has to do. We hear this is not something which the scriptures can do for us. The scriptures can give share with us others' realizations. The script, and the devotees can share their realizations. The devotees may help us to make the connection also, but it is we who have to make the connection. Yes, the scriptures, sometimes devotees get disturbed. I am practicing devotional service and still there are so many problems in my life. So, why is Krishna not helping me? Actually, sometimes our faith may be decreased because of this. But actually for a serious devotee, the problems and sufferings will increase the faith in Krishna, not decrease the faith. Why? Because the devotee said, I was, the scriptures told me that this world is Dukkhalayam and now I am experiencing this world to be Dukkhalayam. So what does it mean? Scriptures are true. I am experiencing scriptures to be true. So in this way, a devotee's faith will increase. Now of course, that doesn't mean that we all have to stay miserable. Scriptures give us a process by which we gain shelter of Krishna and minimize the miseries of material existence. But sometimes we compare our miserable situation with others' comfortable situation and think, why am I suffering? The, but the problem is that we are having a very short-term perspective. Others may be comfortable now, but in the future they will be miserable. We may be miserable now, in the future we may be comfortable. Overall, there is ups and downs. Sometimes we are miserable, sometimes we are comfortable, but overall, this is a doomed journey where the misery will keep increasing, increasing, increasing and there is no escape from it. So, for a serious devotee, the misery of material existence confirm the teachings of Krishna, this world is a place of misery. See, the materialistic worldview and the spiritual worldview are exactly opposite. If you see, the movies often depict H-E-A, happily ever after. Yeah, the hero and the heroine came together and they lived happily ever after. Now, happily ever after is the exact opposite of what Krishna tells in 8.4.15 in the Bhagavad Gita. He says, Dukkhale Mashashvata. So, the movies tell us happily, Krishna says Dukkhale. The movies say ever after, Krishna says Ashashvatam. So, it's exact opposite. Now, who is true? Actually, nobody lives ever after and very few people live happily. So, it's not true. This world is Dukkhale Mashashvatam. So, as long as we have this... Mm, lollipop idea of spirituality. Lollipop idea of spirituality is the child likes a lollipop and when he gets a lollipop, oh, I'm happy now, everything is fine. So like that, we think that if just something that we want, if we get it, some problem that we, we are having, if it gets solved, everything will be alright. And spirituality will provide me that and everything will be solved. No, if we have this lollipop idea of spirituality, then we will not be able to be steady in spiritual life. Because that is not what spirituality actually teaches. What the scriptures teach us, this world is a place of misery and we have to raise our consciousness to go beyond misery. So now, let's look a little bit more seriously at how this world is a place of misery. So when we understand this, then we will be able to go beyond it. So Srila Prabhupada explained later in the purport that the body is a bad bargain. So how is the body a bad bargain? So we can look at it from four perspectives. So this is the acronym DIVE. When we understand this, then we will dive deep into Krishna Consciousness. We will move far away from material enjoyment and we will dive deep into Krishna Consciousness. So D is duration. Let's look at the body and consider. The body provides some enjoyment and the body causes some suffering. 
So if we contrast, what is the duration of the enjoyment and what is the duration of the suffering? If you think of the enjoyment, actually the enjoyment lasts for a few moments, a few minutes. People fantasize about sex almost throughout their youth, throughout their life. But actually, sexual enjoyment, how long does it last? For a few minutes. And after the body's capacity gets exhausted, one cannot enjoy. But in contrast, how long does suffering last? If somebody gets a, uh, some toothache, then the toothache may be there throughout the day for days and days together. If somebody has ulcer, any movement of the tongue causes pain. Somebody has back pain, it's a constant pain. And so nowadays people get terminal diseases like say cancer or something like that. And they are sometimes screaming in pain for weeks and weeks together. The only way they can be calm is by giving heavy doses of painkillers. So what is happening? If you look at it comparatively, the amount of time, amount, the duration for which the body gives us suffering is far, far greater than the duration for which the body gives pleasure. And therefore, if one thinks about this seriously, one will recognize that the body is not a very good bargain. If my goal in this bargain is happiness, then I'm going to get far more misery than enjoyment. And if you look at the sense of enjoyment that we get, not everybody gets that. And those who get that also, they get for a little time. And But ultimately, everybody has to grow, and everybody has to get diseased, and everybody has to die. So people getting diseases is far, far greater in proportion and in duration than people getting enjoyment. So for duration-wise, the body gives far greater suffering than pleasure. Then after that, D is I. I is intensity. What does intensity mean? That when we try to enjoy the body, actually speaking, the body is made in such a way that it is sensitized far more for pain than for pleasure. You don't imagine this, but suppose there is a man who is in a sensual version of paradise where he is lying down on a soft cushioned bed and there are soft hands of some beautiful angelic women who are massaging him, caressing him and his whole body is getting wow. He is he's feeling great pleasure and somehow on the bed on which he is lying at one place there is a, there's a pin. And that pin pricks. Ah! The, all the pleasure that was in all the other parts of the body, that is countered just by that one pricking sensation of the pain. pain. Or suppose somebody is eating some delicious item. Suppose there is some delicious sweet rice made. And is eating the sweet rice. And the sweet rice is so delicious that one thinks, you know, I want every square millimeter of my tongue to taste the sweet rice. So when the sweet rice comes, I don't just drink it, I don't just chew it, I let it move around on my tongue. So that now the delicious sweet rice and every millimeter of my tongue is relishing the sweet rice. At that time, as I'm moving my, my tongue to taste the sweet rice, cut. The tongue is caught between the two. Ah! Now there is a delicious taste on the whole tongue. But one small part of the tongue is bitten. And what happens? all the pleasure that was there, it disappears. So actually, if you think of it, the body is sensitized much more for pain than for pleasure. And again, it's a bad bargain. In terms of intensity, the pain that the body can experience is far greater than the pleasure. Then there is variety. Variety means that actually the bodily parts the ways they can give us pleasure and the ways they can cause us pain, uh, they are not the same. The body can give us pleasure in a few ways, but it can cause us pain in far, far greater ways. Now the, the eye is, the, how can they give us pleasure? We look at some beautiful object, but how can they cause us pain? Now somebody might hit something, it's terrible. something might go inside the eye, some, sometimes some dust particle goes, some insect goes. Or sometimes some internal germs might be some germs might be there, or some degeneration might occur. The tooth, you know, how many ways can it give pleasure? We eat something, and we cut into that object, and then we delight in it. But actually, the tooth, the teeth are so complex, and they are vulnerable to so many diseases that there is an entire branch of medicine dedicated just for that dentistry. 
and dentistry is a whole different branch within medicine itself but it's entirely different why because there are so many complications that happen and they need to be treated so if you look at the variety the amount of suffering that the body can go through uh, the bodily parts can go through it's far far greater than the amount the variety of ways in which it can give us pleasure like that we can apply for various organs all the sense objects they can cause us suffering in far greater ways than they can cause us pleasure so the skin we may touch it on some soft object may give us pleasure but you know something hot can fall on it something sharp can cut it something cold can cold can freeze it and there's so many different ways in which the skin can be uh, causing us pain some diseases may come on it so a variety and then lastly is extent extent means that actually speaking as compared to the number of parts of the body that can give pleasure the number of parts of the body that can give pain are far greater actually within the body it is only the senses the karmendriya and the gyanendriya those are they can give us pleasure is there any way my liver can put me in ecstasy is there some way my kidney can give me happiness is there some way my medulla oblongata can make me smile but all of these can make me cry and scream there are so many parts in the body each of them can get diseases and not just one there are so many diseases that they can get so if you look at the extent the body is as per the body composition is concerned the number of parts of the body that can give us pain are far far greater and because of this the body is a bad bargain so when we understand this then we will dive deep into krishna consciousness rather than hoping i'll find some enjoyment here some enjoyment there we understand there's no hope of enjoyment here let me just dive deep into krishna consciousness rise above the bodily level and then seek happiness at the spiritual level so now how do we make the best use of a bad bargain that is through dharma artha kama and moksha this is the vedic system this is called as apara dharma apara dharma means that this is material religion why is it called material because it is focuses on living harmoniously in this world people are primarily interested in artha and kama but there's a whole system of dharma artha kama which leads to material harmony and spiritual progress how is there material harmony because when people do dharma they live in a sustainable way now we can understand this at a social level and at a cosmic level at a social level dharma gives us a moral principles and then because of these moral principles the artha is managed equitably now when people understand that i should not take other people's property this is what morality teaches and morality uh, is also taught in the scripture so scripture teaches morality and what happens is by that we learn we learn uh, we the artha is managed equitably otherwise if people start in uh, throwing whatever money i get i just take it then then there will be chaos a similarly kama you know people have material desires but dharma tells us there is a regulation there is marriage and with marriage there is a culture of responsibility and commitment and then two people come together and live in a dignified way but if there is no dharma then people start fulfilling their kama in any way so anyway that leads to a disruption we'll discuss that but what dharma does is at a moral level it brings about for us harmony and artha and kama are provided for in a equitable way we can look at it at a higher cosmic level also now we see that uh, when we don't do yagya then rains will not come and then there is, when the nature does not provide its necessities then we will have disruption now people may say people may not believe that yagya produces rains but the point is at least we have to recognize that we are dependent on nature and if we disrupt the ecology then it is we who will have to suffer and that is what is happening so human beings have disrupted the ecology in a very disastrous way we have desertification deforestation pollution so many ways in which the climate change that is happening the climate change is actually euphemism a soft sounding word for what is actually likely to be environmental super disasters 
So that is all coming up. So dharma keeps us in harmony with the higher principles of nature, the higher beings in nature. And then artha and kama are fulfilled in an equ equitable way. And gradually by seeing the principle of dharma work, one develops faith, one inquires further, what is the scripture all about? And through the scriptures one learns about moksha. And then one starts striving for liberation also. It's a gradual process. But dharma, artha, kama, moksha, it's a progression that keeps human beings on a positive track. This is the best use of a bad bargain. I have got a body, I cannot just wish away the body. As I said, the soul and the body are united together now. It's a bad match, but it's it's a match. I cannot, even if I understand I'm not the body, I cannot suddenly get rid of the body. So how do I get rid of the body? There is a process for that. There's a process of purification by which we develop detachment. And that process is of harmonious living. So we want to go back to Krishna Aparadharma is like a gradual way up. Aparadharma may not take us immediately back to Krishna, but Aparadharma takes us to Swarga. It enables us to live gradual in a harmonious way. Dharma, we go up to Swarga, come back, go up to Swarga, come back. This is Karma Kanda essentially. But by this one learns that scriptures work, what scripture says is true. And then we look at the higher teaching in scripture. The higher teaching in scripture is that actually don't just get caught in Dharma Artha Kama, practice Dharma for developing love for God and go back to God. So now, before we talk about Aparadharma, let us talk about Adharma. So there is Aparadharma, there is Paradharma and there is Adharma. Aparadharma is material religion. Material religion doesn't necessarily mean in a bad sense. People need to have their material needs fulfilled and if they follow the dharmic morality and live dharmically while fulfilling their material needs, then there will be harmony in society, even at a material level. So, Aparadharma is important, but Aparadharma is not the most important. Above Aparadharma is Paradharma. Paradharma is pure devotional service. 1, 2, 6 in the Bhagavatam says, Savai Pumsam Paro Dharmo Yato Bhakti Radhokshaje Ahaituki Apratihata Yayatma Suprasidati. This is what will make a soul happy. This is what Bhagavatam calls as Paradharma, supreme religion. So, this is the religion by which one develops pure love for the transcendental Lord. So now Aparadharma is there, which is Aparadharma, Dharma Artha Moksha. And Paradharma is Prema, pure love for God. So now both are important. If there is a conflict between the two, Paradharma should be chosen. But in general, Aparadharma and Paradharma can be harmonized. In contrast to these two is Adharma. Adharma means instead of making the best use of a bad bargain, we would make the worst use of a bad bargain. What is the worst use of a bad bargain? We actually seek only Artha and Kama. In the, in the four part sequence of Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha, we see become obsessed only with Artha and Kama. And what does it lead to? Spiritual degradation and material devastation. So how spiritual degradation? Because the pursuit of Artha and Kama, there is nothing spiritual in it. In fact, everything in the pursuit of Artha and Kama drags us down to materialistic consciousness and the more materialistic our consciousness the more away from spirituality we go and the more immoral things we will do so this material de spiritual degradation that is there that will happen and not only that the nature of lust the nature of anger the nature of greed is such that they will not only disrupt our spiritual life they will disrupt our material life also when people's lust is uncontrolled then they do so many things, they attack other people and violate other people when people's greed is uncontrolled. They exploit other people, they even, uh, they even uh, want for their own joy, they cause them to starve and die and suffer terribly. So even there is material devastation that results. So dharma is like the check on people's pursuit for artha and karma. It directs them properly. When there is no dharma, then the, the, the drive for artha and karma goes mad. It starts a rioting and it results in spiritual degradation and material destruction. So therefore, this adharma is most inauspicious. And Srila Prabhupada writes, our condition is like a condition of a sick person. When a sick person tries to enjoy, essentially two things happen. The sickness worsens and the sickness prolongs. If I have got stomach upset and at that time I decide to eat a feast, all that will happen is, Actually, my stomach upset will become worse and it will take longer to get cured. Similarly, Prabhupada says that if we try to enjoy in this current disease condition of mental existence, then 
we will only create more karmic bondage that means there will be more suffering and to become free from that karmic bondage will take more time so our karmatical condition will become worse will worsen and will take longer to heal so therefore don't try to enjoy in the disease condition that doesn't mean we have to give up all material enjoyment but we have to restrict our enjoyment within dharmic limits so that is the program that is given by the great sages now it's ultimately coming from the scriptures but according to time place circumstances the great saints and sages tell us how to apply it so Srila Prabhupada is a great saint who is telling us how to apply Krishna consciousness in the modern society now when our uh, when there is this equitable arrangement of dharma, artha, kama, moksha. Then that leads to progress, that leads to advancement. How does it lead to advancement? Because it leads to the elevation of the soul. So, elevation of the soul means that people's material needs are taken care of. So, Apara Dharma does teach people. So, as devotees, Nishla Prabhupada wanted Varanashram Dharma to be established. Now, Varanashram Dharma, in and of itself, is not necessarily spiritual. It is a social arrangement. So, the Prabhupada calls Varanas the social classes, Ashrams are the spiritual classes. So, it is, it is a social arrangement, but a social arrangement that is very that is conducive for spiritual advancement. So, Shila Prabhupada wanted that. Why? Because that is one way where Aparadharma can be established, so that Paradharma can be practiced. Uh, Aparadharma creates like a foundation, a uh, safety net, so that the Paradharma is like a walk on a tightrope. What does Aparadharma means? Aparadharma essentially means living in a harmonious way materially. So, as devotees, you know, if some devotees may become brahmacharis or sannyasis, they renounce the world. But devotees who are, most devotees will be householders. And the devotees are householders, they have to act as responsible family members, they have to act as responsible citizens. And by this way, they contribute to their own well-being and they contribute to the well-being of society. Those who renounce the world, they also contribute to the well-being of society in a different way, by sharing spiritual knowledge. Everybody has to do the dharma. The grihasthas have to do the dharma, the dharma, the brahmachas and sannyasis also have to do their dharma. And this, somebody may say, oh, my family life is just material. No, but if I am in the family life, then my material life, I have to take care in a responsible way. Otherwise, it becomes so complex that eventually it distracts me from spiritual life. So when I am responsible, if a student studies properly, and the student's material career is more or less steadily going on. If the student doesn't study properly, fails the exam, then there's no material career clearly ahead, available. Then, it will, the student will find it very difficult to practice spiritual life also, because the material anxiety will become too much. So, aparadharma has to be managed. And that is important. That's why it says, vidyam cha vidyam cha yastad bhayom bhayom So, vidya here refers to, avidya refers to aparadharma. So, now, along with managing Aparadharma, one also has to practice Paradharma. Paradharma means uh, pure devotional service. That alone will satisfy the heart. Just taking care of the body the needs is not going to satisfy the heart. So that happens by Paradharma. And that's why the Bhagavatam uses the striking phrase, Kaitava Dharma. Kaitava means cheating. So it says that if religion doesn't take us towards devotion to God, it is also Kaitava Dharma. Dharma projita kaita votra paramo nirmat saranasata. So anything short of pure devotional service can satisfy neither Krishna nor the soul. And because it cannot satisfy, therefore it is not the actual blessing of life. Shri Prabhupada writes in this translation, the full blessings of immortality. So that we get only when we practice paradharma. So while practicing a paradharma for our social level, we actually practice paradharma for our liberation. That means we do, somebody may say that. Oh, I have so many family responsibilities, I have so many national duties, I have so many professional obligations, I don't have time for practicing spiritual life. No, these are also important, but if one gets caught up only in these, then one will not get any spiritually tangible result by that. One may get some materially good result, but one will continue on the cycle of birth and death. So therefore, one has to practice paradharma. And not only one will have to continue the cycle of birth and death, one will also have not get real happiness, because real happiness comes when the soul connects in love with Krishna. Now, let's conclude with understanding of the glory of bhakti. So, bhakti actually balances between karma and jnana. So, we have senses. So, if there is only avidya, that means only there is no, no spiritual knowledge is there, then one does karma. What, is, what do we do in karma? 
in karma we abuse senses for material purpose i have got senses i just use them for sense enjoyment and that becomes an abuse because i don't regulate them and even the even the body suffers because of unregulated sensual enjoyment so actually now in one sense doing activity acting according to a sensual desire that is natural but it is binding so that is one extreme of the pendulum the other extreme of the pendulum is jnana in jnana one see the senses cause me suffering therefore i reject the senses and i use them for neither material purpose nor spiritual purpose i just say senses are false sense objects are false everything in this world is false i just want to become silent and i want to merge into brahman now if i can live like this i will not get bound it's non binding but it's unnatural to be completely inactive to reject what what are our sensory faculties is is unnatural it's almost impossible for most people even for those people who it is possible it is very laborious klesho dikhtaraste sham krishna says in bhagavad gita in 12.5 it's great klesha is there so bhakti is the steady state of the pendulum mean bhakti we use material senses for spiritual purpose that means we use our senses to serve krishna and thereby the material senses which were earlier a cause of bondage now become the cause of liberation so because we have senses engaging the senses is natural for us engaging in physical activity is natural for us because we are in a physical body acting action is natural so bhakti yoga is natural because bhakti yoga involves activity but because that activity is not selfish because that activity is divinely selfless meant for krishna it is liberating so in this way if you want liberation then so avidya mrityum tirtva avidya mrityum tirtva means that by practicing adharma sorry by practicing apara dharma one will be able to negotiate one's journey through this world and vidyaya amrita mashnate by practicing para dharma by practicing devotional service one will attain eternity and in this way one can make this journey through life successful Just to summarize we discussed today about, firstly about how immortality is impossible materially whether it is through mystic power or through scientific power basically the six the three additional changes that in soul matter goes through growth reproduction and self preservation these are not only unstoppable they are incomprehensible so materially immortality is impossible and how is it possible spiritually so where does the longing for immortality come from this matter is the world is temporary soul wants eternity why is that soul belongs to another world so to learn what the miseries of mortal existence teaches we have to connect education with experience then learning will happen hmm. then we discussed about how this material world is a bad bargain so d i v e as compared to the amount of enjoyment the body can provide and the amount of suffering the duration of suffering is far greater than enjoyment the intensity of suffering is far greater than enjoyment the varieties of suffering are far greater than that of enjoyment and the extent of the body part that give us sufferings are far more than the extent of the body part that give us pleasure so once we understand is a bad bargain then how do we make the best use of a bad bargain that is by dharma artha kama moksha it creates material harmony and it creates a foundation for spiritual progress it's slow it's a slow way up gradually so but we have to have some morality religious morality and some order in our material life also we do our responsibilities this comprises apara dharma so apara dharma will enable us to navigate the journey of life and para dharma is pure devotional service by practicing the activities of devotional service we will get liberated and we will return back to krishna the glory of bhakti is that it it integrates the virtues of karma and jnana while removing their deficiencies the virtue of karma is that it is natural we have senses we want to engage in activity uh, but the problem with karma is that it is binding the virtue of jnana is that it is non binding but the problem is it is unnatural because to be inactive is unnatural for the soul so the bhakti integrates the naturalness of karma with the non bindingness of jnana by using material senses for spiritual purposes and by this we can become purified and liberated thank you very much shri shop nishad ki jai shri prabhupad ki jai gaur bhakta vrinda ki jai tai gaur prema nandi hari